Hello, everybody, and welcome to the NASDAQ Dorsey Wright podcast for the week ending on December 2nd. My name is Ian Saunders, and I'm joining here, Will Gibson. I think, Will, it's a uh, been a few been a few weeks since I've been on here, so I'm just, yeah. I'm joining you at this point. It's a it's, it's you are job. joining me at this point. <laughs> I used to say thanks for having me on, and I'm gonna start telling you thanks for all right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks for coming. Well, on. the 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 role roll, roll, rolls reversed a little bit, but <laughs> we've certainly seen a little bit of a reversal in some of the market movement over the past few weeks. It's been a few weeks since we've gone over uh, broader market movement or broader kind of indicator changes that we've seen. Uh, we were were blessed to be joined by um, some, some member of the the Nasdaq economic team, so it was, it was great to have them on. And then took a little hiatus for a week with the Thanksgiving holiday here in the U.S., uh, but it's good to be back and be back here in person and uh, good to see some some green on the screen. Uh, that's for sure. It was a pretty solid month of November that we saw for most major domestic equity indices. I mean, honestly, it's pretty, pretty solid Q4 thus far. Um, it it kind of culminated in the final trading day of November yesterday. We were taking a look at some of the chart movement there for some of the major indices like the S&P 500 with SPX. I mean, busting through that that 200-day moving average. Um, certainly a pretty notable thing. I know I saw a lot of uh, commentary around that just mm-hmm. in, the, in the Twitter world or, or wherever. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's certainly good to see that. I mean, looking at the 20-point chart of the s and I mean, two consecutive buy signals, breaking back through to a positive trend, um, ticking back toward that that kind of August rally level, but still got a little ways to go for we're going to get up there. But it's it's good to see that kind of consistent improvement series of higher lows that we've seen for that uh, that default 20 point chart for the S&P there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you said, I I think this looks looks healthy right here. You are, I've seen a lot of people, people, people talking about 4100 as a potential area of resistance, which is where we're hovering around right now. And you mentioned we're getting to your August highs. Those are up around 4300. For reference, your June highs were at 4160. So all in this range, likely a pretty deep, a pretty decent battleground for the S&P 500. Mm-hmm. Re- referencing some of the highs, though, we don't talk about the Dow maybe as much as we talk about the S&P or e- even the NASDAQ. But the Dow, if you look at that index chart, and that chart looks, looks a, a, a lot different. That actually cleared its August highs. It's actually one of the ma- only major equity indices to do that. s and is below, NASDAQ's below, even the Russell 2000, like small cap spend leaders as of late, that's also below its August highs. The Dow of all the major indices is actually above those August highs. And what was the stat that you were saying before about the Dow performance that yeah, I mean, the Dow's been a strong grow, right? I mean, it just mentioned domestic equities in general having a pretty strong Q4. S&P is up of, of almost 14% through market movement through November um, over the past two months. So in October, November, S&P is up almost 14%. Uh, Dow's up 20%. So, I mean, it's the, it's the only in one just two months. in just two months. Just since September 30th of this year, the Dow's up 20.41% on, on a price return basis. Um, so it's the only one of the big major market indices to be kind of technically out of a bear market. We're going to go sure. by the classic 20% down, 20% up, technically kind of out of that range. I've not heard that yet. It's yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, I think the most interesting thing is what you were saying over trailing year basis, you are now positive in the Dow. Um, the Dow is up over trailing one year basis from 1130 2021 to 1130 2022, you're up 0.31%. And that's just price return. That is just strictly price return. If you go in total return, you're up almost two and a half percent for the Dow. Uh, but just from a strict price return perspective, I mean, if you, if you said, uh, looked out a year from last year and said you were flat. For for the Dow over the 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 coming year, I don't think you quite would have thought you would have yeah. gotten the picture we've seen over the past year. No, I mean if if I had that on a test, true or false, the Dow is positive on a trailing twelve month basis. I would say false. False every time. Yeah. False every time. Right. Well, now. Hey, we're, we're we're positive at least for the time being. At least at the time of this recording right, right. on Thursday, December first. We'll see what happens by the time this comes out there on Friday morning. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean it's 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 positive, right? I mean it's it's yeah. positive. It's good to see it positive. It's good to see that kind of return to the upside. Yeah, yeah, and you mentioned the past two months have been pretty strong, acknowledging that first day of December here, December is historically a pretty strong month for the market. This is based on S&P 500 data that I have here, but 79% of the time, roughly 80% of the time, the month of December is positive for the S&P 500 Dow stat would be very close to that. So maybe we keep some, some of the train rolling here. Yeah. Yeah. And and I mean, looking at the, I mean, well, we say we don't talk about the Dow and then we're going to talk about the Dow for, for a good chunk of time exactly here. What we're do, yeah. But the, I mean, the Dow, some of the names within that, 
I, I mean, have been to see it positive on a year to day basis. It's not the names that you would kind of expect, or at least that have yeah. historically hung in there and kind of led the Dow higher, right? I mean, those mega cap technology names haven't done as poorly as other technology areas, but they're certainly not the leaders from an RS perspective within the Dow anymore. No. Um, I mean, just looking from an absolute perspective with Apple, I mean, it's still a four for fiver from a technical attribute perspective. I'm considered a buy on the system, right? But it's in a negative trend, moved to a negative trend there and back into a negative trend in, in late September and has tried on two separate occasions. It's now its third occasion to try to test that bearish resistance line and break back through and hasn't been able to do it. Um, definitely meeting some some pretty notable resistance right at that that resistance line, that kind of clear line you can see depicted there on that default chart. Yeah, yeah. And we'll toss that chart on YouTube if you're watching. But Ian, to your point, that's been a level that's been interesting to see Apple unable to break through some of the generals, as we'll call them, have not been leading the market higher. You see that get flushed out in a lot of the equal weighted indices behaving much better. S&P 500 as well, that would be true. But sticking with the Dow, I think another name, actually, before I get to that other name, you know what? I'll say the other name, Microsoft as well, another blue chip household name, mm -hmm. similar type of charting behavior. That's also in a negative trend. And these two stocks have something in common. One, that they were both removed from some of our models mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the system, some some of the more popular stock models, which we'll touch on a little bit more. But it's it's not the names you would expect to see getting removed from some of these models as the market's starting to maybe make a turn. Yeah, well, at least it's not the names that have been in there for a while, right? I mean, you had Apple. With Apple was the removal from our NDX rotation models, looking at all the top 10 RS names from the NASDAQ 100. Um, fell out of there. It had been in that model since January. Um, we had Moderna actually coming to that. So, I mean, healthcare has been... You've seen some improvement from from yeah. certainly some focus names within there. Seen some notable improvement recently. Moderna, one of those coming into that portfolio. Uh, Microsoft, as you mentioned, that's within our we call it a blue chip growth model. Um, essentially, looking at the high RS that trying to hold on to the top five names from the Dow thirty, right? Um, and that saw Microsoft coming out. Uh, it had been a holding since twenty seventeen, mm -hmm. so it's been a holding for for quite a while, for five years. Um, I think it was bought at 63 bucks was the last time on that from a back tested perspective that that, <laughs> that stock could come in there. Um, quadruple performance. Not so it's, it's not 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 too bad, but um, certainly has not seen the year this year for Microsoft that you might have kind of expected yeah. uh, coming into it. It typically see, tends to be one of the steadier tech names, um, but it's been more steady movement lower recently, um, or at least looking at the past year than, than we saw previously. We did get a return to a buy signal with movement yesterday there from Microsoft, uh, jumped back up and broke a triple top formation at 252. And it's creeping back towards that trend line. As you mentioned, Microsoft's the three for fiver, seems a little bit more weakness there than Apple, um, isn't a negative trend, but we have a pretty close um, bearish resistance line for that as well. If it can get back up to the upper 260s at 268 level, would kind of bust through that resistance line and return it to a positive trend. Um, but at some of these other areas, I mean, the Dow in and of itself, getting into a little bit extended territory. Yeah. I mean, the Dow is 92% overbought, just from a straight index perspective mm -hmm. um, that we're seeing through market movement there. So I think that'll be pretty interesting to note, to keeping an eye on some of these names. Uh, these runs can't continue forever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think breathers will be healthy around these levels. You, you mentioned the Dow is pretty extended. Some of the international areas are as well, which we'll get to later in the discussion. But stick with my Microsoft, something else you, you mentioned it being one of the more steady attribute names. Microsoft had been a low attribute since May of 2013. So wow. it's still, that I means three, four, five rated on the system. So it hasn't been lower than a three since May of 2013. So I think that's notable, not, not to say that we're necessarily going to see that here, but on that relative price performance basis, it hasn't been able to keep up with some of those other Dow stocks in that model, which led to that most recent change of it getting re removed. And the addition being Chevron was also maybe maybe what you would expect this year, given how strong energy has been, but given the the pedigree and the history of names like Microsoft or Apple, it's not the changes that you would expect. Yeah. I mean, you take a name like Microsoft, it's down 25% year to date, and you take a name like Chevron, right? I mean, oil's been in the news a lot. Oil's certainly seen a lot of retraction from its highs earlier in the year. Chevron is still up 56% on a year to date basis. Incredible. I mean, that is, that is an incredible. We've talked a lot in the report about the separation between 
um, through oil focused stocks or energy equities and actual energy commodity prices themselves. We can dive into a little bit more of that, but there's been some pretty notable differences there in that movement. We've seen declining strength from commodities, haven't seen as much declining strength from the, the energy space. And Chevron has, has maintained enough strength to kind of move into the top position there, the move into the holding there from uh, the top RS names in the Dow. Yeah. Yeah. No, like you said, energy equities still remain very strong, pretty resilient, given what you've seen crude oil do. Looking at the blue chip holdings now, it's a pretty diverse set of sector representation. You have energy, you have industrials, you have more consumer discretionary staples, healthcare. So evenly split out some decent sector leadership really across the board there. Healthcare has been strong. Mm -hmm. Staples have been on, on a relative basis behaving pretty well. Consumer discretionary has been hit or miss. It's really focused areas of strength there. And then you got energy and industrials that perked up lately. So interesting mix in that blue chip model, getting back to that Chevron addition and energy equities being able to continue their strength while crude oil has been weakening. We talked about this in a lot more detail in a recent report. It was from November 18th. If you want to go look in the archives on our platform, or if you're not a subscriber to the platform, you can go check the article out. Oh, it should be. Yeah, oh, yeah, it should be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly plug our own there you go. platform while we're on here. But yeah, in this report, we we talked about when you see crude oil, the spread, so the performance between crude oil and XLE, a, a major energy equity ETF. And you can look at this versus other equity energy representatives and you get similar dates. Times when you had a 20% or more spread. So crude oil underperformed the energy market by 20% or more. And there's only a handful of times that you've seen this type of dislocation. In order to like really extrapolate something forward from that, it's far from conclusive. But what you can see is that there's typically been a lot of volatility in both areas after you see this type of dispersion. And more often than not, you see a bit of give and take from, from both parties. Yeah. And I think that's the, I think that that expectation of a little bit of give and take for both is a prudent thing to keep in mind as we yeah. kind of look toward the end of the year. Um, but that weakness from the broader commodity, the broader kind of crude oil space in particular, um, and we've seen crude in and of itself, looking at that, that the default chart there for crude oil, yeah. um, not a pretty chart. It's pretty, well, seen a lot of movement this year. I'm personally, I kind of like, especially this year, you back that chart out to a two point chart. Um, you get some pretty kind of consistent movement. I mean, it moved saw rapid rise in, in price earlier this year, jumping up from that 64 level in late December of last year, all the way up to 130 um, on that two-point chart by March, right? Um, which, I mean, that's at that time, a lot of calls out there for mm. crudes going to 200. I mean, could oh, yeah, tons as, of as a base case, right? Oh, yeah. Um, crazy. And, and we, we saw- to the same podcast, podcast <laughs> last night. <laughs> we, we saw a little bit of a back off there, rallied back up up to 122 by June. And as now you saw a string of, what was that, five consecutive sell signals down into August from crude oil there on that two-point chart. Um, and then a little bit of back and forth movement, but it's maintained, it moved into a negative trend on that two point chart in August. And it's kind of ma maintained that that trend line lower um, with movement over the past several weeks, currently sitting at a chart level there around 80 bucks. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's definitely been some pretty consistent movement lower, not a, a massive steep drop, but a lot of steep drops that, that have just kind of continued to move it lower. Still up 7% year to date better than a lot of other areas, yeah. um, but it's certainly not moving in the right direction. No, no, I mean, like you said, crude oil got down to your December 2021 level, so it essentially, essentially wiped out all your 2022 gains, which is crazy, like you said, yeah, given how much it's ran. And then if you look across the broader commodity landscape, you've seen some pockets of strength. Precious metals have perked up a little bit. Agriculture has been more of a steady performer, I would say, kind of hanging in there. But all of that has culminated to, I'd say, some notable changes on our more macro indicators. That weakness has led to some of the DALI rankings, which is dynamic asset level investing on our system, to see some deterioration from commodities and domestic equities moving up as mm -hmm. a result yeah. of that. Yeah, certainly. So Dolly, I mean, as you touched on dynamic asset level investing, really just a broad relative strength ranking of six asset classes, right? Um, cash is still number one. And now, like you said, commodities just declines, lost uh, 45 signals over the past couple months there, dropping down into the third position. Is at a tie with domestic equities at 196 high signals each. Um, but 
it's shown domestic equity has shown more near term improvement. So it gets that higher rank, even though they're still tied. Um, but like we, we've touched on commodities backed off a lot in strength. We had a little bit in the report earlier this week, um, kind of touching on some of the nuts and bolts of the declining strength that we've seen from commodities. We've seen improvement from domestic equities, but the story's really been the decline from yeah. domestic equities, it, domestic equity or decline from commodities yeah. rather. Yeah. Domestic equities has only picked up eight RS buy signals in the fourth quarter so far. Um, meanwhile, you have seen the uh, commodities asset class drop down 45 signals over the past um, over the past two months. So seen a lot of weakness over the course of the past couple of months there. And uh, energy still hanging in there. Yeah. Top sector in, in, in the, the dollar ranking. So that kind of speaks to some more of that separation between certainly. energy equities and the broader commodity asset class in and of itself. Yeah, certainly. And keeping in mind, Dolly is relative strength based. So even though we led our discussion today with some absolute strength that we've seen from domestic equity markets, we're may first be scratching your head thinking why are domestic equities not gaining more signals mm -hmm. and i think a lot of that could partially be attributed to other areas gaining more mm -hmm. signals or other areas doing actually better than domestic equities and that's been international i believe they they've picked up how many signals the most signals right yeah certainly the most signals i mean international has picked up 47 it's picked up 47 signals mm -hmm. in the month of november alone and yeah. it picked up 62 signals so far in the fourth quarter um, so, I mean, mo you're seeing declining signals, there's signal loss from cash, cash has moved down some from signals, still holding on firmly to that number one position, lost some signals, domestic equities picked up a few, um, I haven't really seen many other changes from, uh, or many other improving areas just because international has taken all, right? I mean, right. It's moved up 62 signals, still sits in the fourth position in an underweight posture in the bottom half of those Dolly rankings, but it's getting closer. Um, and so definitely, I mean, definitely could be an area to kind of look toward as we, as we're entering the, the final month of the year, kind of looking toward 2023. Yeah. And that international equity participation as of late, I think has been maybe more important or played a larger role in some of the recovery. Cause when you saw the run in March and June and August, you didn't see by any extent, the same amount of international participation. Mm -hmm. So to your point, I think this is positive to see some of the international areas catching a bid. I know two major funds, we won't really dive into them in too much detail, but if you look at like EFA, like a developed markets proxy, I mean, huge stem after a series of consecutive sell signals that's above the top of its trading band right now. I believe that fund is also the most overbought it's been since December of 2020. But we're representative of that just resurgence of demand coming back on. Is it really since December of 2020? I'm pretty that's, sure. That's, yeah. that's impressive. I mean, weekly reading of 100.2% mm -hmm. through yesterday. Mm -hmm. So double check on myself. No, no, I'm I'm believing that's just such, that's definitely a lot. I mean, you're talking yeah, about, yeah, overbought. Um, and we think the domestic equity side of things is getting a little bit overbought. And then you see a stem like that. It's pretty, uh, pretty shocking. Yeah. yeah. Um, definitely. A good kind of shocking for if you're an international equity investor, but shocking yeah. on the last. Yeah, and EEM not as large of a stem as EFA by any means, but consecutive buy signals there. You haven't seen that for two years. You know, May of 2020 was the last time you saw consecutive, or excuse me, November 2020 was the last time you saw a second consecutive buy signal there. Right, and we just ended a streak of what is that 11 consecutive sell signals? Most in I believe history. it was. Yeah, yeah the most in the, in the history of the PNF chart. Right, going back as far back as we have it with the available index data on the site, most sell signals we'd seen consecutively, and now we've even two consecutive buys. Yeah. Now, is that going to say we're going to see our longest streak of consecutive buys? I mean, I, we're certainly oh, nice, <laughs> hopefully, but certainly not going so far to say that. But yeah. seeing consistent movement higher after such a big downdraft is a good sign for the, for the asset class from a near term perspective. Um, we're still in a negative trend, kind of creeping back up toward that. that um, that bearish resistance line currently positioned around that 40, 50 point, also right around the top of that trading band. So mm -hmm. not as overbought as you were saying, not as not on as much of a stem, but still getting a little bit frothy within some of these areas that have seen a big pickup over the past right. couple of months. Right. Yeah. So near term, I think there is some overextension in the international space, a bit in the domestic space as well. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't get a 3% update and then everything just looks normal. So right. there is some extension there. Maybe some maybe some consolidation for the near term. Hopefully, keep some higher bottoms going in the chart, and hopefully, see some follow through. I think that would be something to watch. Yeah, I think consistency would be the name of the game in December. I mean, like you said, hopefully, we get another 
what almost 80 percent of December's have been positive and so mm-hmm. hopefully hopefully we'll get another one of those coming up here over the next month but to see in that consistent improvement I think it's yeah. going to be a um, be a good sign as we look toward next year yeah I mean December's been positive like you said 79 80 percent of the time that was since 87 so we we are in an environment that economically you know people are looking back to the 70s so take it for what you will but that that's the data we can run some other numbers there and get back to them next week on that we can't get back to you on that next week <laughs> perfect well with that I, I think uh i think that's about ready to get us get us landing the plane here will is there anything else we wanted to touch on i don't have anything no wonderful find the land Oh, great. Well, yeah, um, I think that wraps up most of what we're kind of looking to cover here. And it's going to be a lot of market movements uh, potentially over the course of the next week, um, looking at continuous trading days and market holidays over the next week. Right. So we'll, we'll be back back here next week. Um, so thank you very much to everyone for joining us here. And we look forward to talking to you again next week.